So I understand we are um, competing with uh, some sort of Mediterranean hummus and losing badly. So I appreciate all of you guys tearing yourselves away from whatever uh, repast is going out there. I hope you don't mind. I, I brought my mobile phone. I'm expecting a call, but it'll be brief. So uh, I hope that shouldn't be a problem. Um, all right. We have a lot of content for a very short amount of time. So I am going to try to do this quickly. That said, we have a very august panel who actually know what they're talking about, unlike me. So I'm going to start with uh, my good friend, Amanda Richmond, president of Starcom USA. Uh, Amanda oversees the agency's approach to activation and investment uh, over across their four offices, working on clients like Airbnb, Allstate, Bank of America, Best Buy, Kellogg's, Samsung, others. Uh, she has a list of accolades in this piece of paper that is actually awe-inspiring. I will just read a couple. Uh, advertising Age, Media Maven, iMedia 25 Innovators, Top 25 Innovators from Media Post, 40 Under 40, which she got last year. Um, she is a friend, she is a mentor. So generous. She's a friend, she's a mentor, she's a fellow warrior in the fight to rescue marketing from the clutches of advertising, Amanda Richmond. Um, next up to Amanda's right, your left, uh, is Aaron Fetters. He is the Senior Vice President of Comscore Marketing Solutions. He has been in the industry for 17 years, starting when he was 12 at Procter & Gamble, <laughs> and then moving to the Kellogg Company. Aaron also well. has oh. received multiple recognitions, that's what it says here, recognitions, uh, for marketing research industry. In 2015, he got the ARF Great Minds Game Changer Leadership Award, <laughs> and was also more recently named one of the 40 under 40. Um, to Aaron's right, your left, is Jane Clark, a woman who clearly needs no introduction to this audience. She is the CEO and Managing Director of the Coalition for Innovation in Media Measurement, which I've always called SIM, and I actually now know what the four words are. <laughs> uh, she is responsible for developing SIM strategy and vision and overseeing all day-to-day -day operations. Uh, prior to SIM, she was Vice President of Insights and Innovation at Time Warner Global Media Group. She is on the board of the Advertising Research Foundation and ICOM. And she was a BNC Digital All-Star in 2014. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last, but certainly not least, Howard Schimmel, Chief Research Officer at Turner, where he oversees all multi-screen entertainment, news, kids, and sports research, and corporate analysis. Uh, this year, he launched the Ad Lab with the goal of making recommendations about linear and digital innovation in light of the changing TV landscape. I don't know what that means, but apparently things are changing in TV. Um, <laughs> and wait for this. Um, he and his team have been repeatedly honored with industry awards, including Research Business Daily's Client of the Year for Neuroscience. You know, they give that to everybody, but, you know. Uh, <laughs> and he's a recipient of the VAB, uh, Jack Hill Award for Excellence in Integrity in Media Research and its President's Award um, more recently. So that's the panel. No, 40 under 40. I have no idea why I'm up here. So. Okay. So let's just get right into it. Um, question number one. <clears throat> I wrote the questions, they're long. Um, we are experiencing a revolution in the marketing industry, I'm not sure if you guys heard about it, uh, with the consumer in control, publishing their own content, with technological advancements that have radically altered consumer expectation. And as Rob Norman hinted at this morning's session and whispered to me in a cab late last year, uh, we may be at the beginning of the end of the forced viewing economy. Ooh, um, my hair stood up when he said that to me. So now to compete for attention, marketers are radically altering their mix with much more reliance on dialogic environments, or interactive, content, and digital experiential solutions. We are all, in effect, reinventing ourselves for the post-advertising era. In this context, are measurement best practices going through the same sort of scale of revolution? Or as Linda Yaccarino said, do we need to bust out of legacy measurement? Panel, let's discuss. That was for Jack Germond, for anybody who remembers Jack Germond. <laughs> Woo! Uh, who wants it? Well, yes is the Jane. answer. <laughs> OK, well, question two. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all that uh, you know, uh, fragmentation in the marketplace um, makes it just uh, you know, as in incrementally more difficult uh, to pull together um, all of the exposures, the media exposures, and to be able to, to effectively plan, to activate, and to do you know, ROI analysis on the back end when you have so many consumer touch points and so many data sources 
and so many um, different pathways that consumers are taking through it all. So the, the in increased uh, you know, fragmentation on the consumer side leads to um, increased complexity. And I actually say it is a rocket science yeah. to get all of this together um, in, in ways that's usable for marketers, you know, for agencies, for media companies. Yeah, Great. that's the challenge. We're all trying to stitch this all together, right, from various sources and teach our teams then how to stitch together not only the story, but tell the story in a way that's compelling, that isn't just about the source of data and the mm -hmm. scale of the learnings, but how do we then reapply it and optimize against it? Yeah, I, and I would say like the, other, the, the big challenge that, that I always saw as a marketer and I see from my seat now is, yes, measurement is innovating the same way that the way the consumers experience media is, is innovating and changing. And so you're seeing an explosion of not just measurement companies who are playing some role or attempting to play some role, but measures themselves. And, and I always refer back to the signal and the noise, you know, as uh, Nate Silver's book because there's so much noise now being generated, the big challenge is how do you identify the signal in all these new and emerging metrics that actually mean something to right. me as a brand trying to grow my right. business, right? And so I, I think that, yes, we are evolving quickly in measurement, but it also comes with its own challenges around what's noise and what's signal. Great. Yeah, and, and look, the, the other thing I think, and, and it's maybe pretty sad to say, but even something as simple as C3 has dramatically outlived its usefulness. I mean, think about it. We, the industry adopted that in the year 2006, seven. DV, you know, DVR penetration at that time was 10%. You know, now for a network like ours, we have, you know, a third of viewing that goes on beyond seven days. Yet we're still stuck in this old arc, arctic, antique, ar old way of measuring. Sorry. <laughs> and I'm so upset about this. <laughs> and we're not prepared even for the innovation that's coming from the big screen, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, n nothing we've built could be used as pillars for the future. Yeah, uh, I, think, I, I think my own perspective, Aaron, I think is that we probably are in an evolution in measurement and a revolution in how we do marketing, and, and that's probably the mm -hmm. sort of signal to noise ratio there. So. Mm -hmm. um, now you've got a moderator answering his own questions. Isn't this great? You know, it's, no it's, that's free with the price of your admission. So, um, so like building on this though, um, in this brave new world of multi-screen touch points and consumers' frenetic use of all um, all screens that are handy, how are we doing at be able, being able to measure across screen, just the across screen piece, let alone the um, the broader ROI discussion, from a planning perspective, from an orchestration or experiential perspective? Um, and for attribution. Marissa Thalberg, I thought, said it great yesterday. She said she didn't feel like she was getting what she needed adequately. Um, Aaron, was she wrong? Is she wrong? <laughs> um, not entirely. Uh, and, you know, we talked earlier, like, are we there yet on cross between measurement? And I would love to say yes, but then I know Howard will throw something at me. Uh, I would say we're closer. We're, yeah. we're much closer today on cross-screen measurement. I think that the, if you look at the silos of measurement, each of those has gotten stronger over the years. The challenge now is bringing this measurement together in a way that you can, allows measurement companies to come back to agencies and their clients and say, what's the unduplicated reach of your audience across mobile and desktop and television, a true unduplicated reach? What is the impact of that reach? So not just stopping with audience metrics, but going all the way through did that have an impact and what combination of those things had the best and largest impact? How has that helped inform your investment and move forward? I think we're much closer today. Uh, like I said, if I, if I went all the way to tell you, yes, Lou, we can do it, yeah. Howard's gonna throw something at me, but, uh, but I think we're much, much closer today because of the scale of data and the way that the approaches that we're taking, companies like Comscore are taking to bring those assets together and bring that to, to, to you and to you. Yeah, yeah and I, I actually think that um, we at least, I think, have a common vision of where this is yeah. going. So mm -hmm. I think we're starting to see that what you really need is scaled you know, exposure data for all of your platforms. You have to be able to link those via identity and then match them to other data sets, also you know, mm -hmm. through some linking of identities, uh, and then be able to use that for targeting for optimization in real time, hopefully activation and optimization, and then you know the ROI analysis. So I think people know what they want. The problem is there's holes right. everywhere along this vision, and there is there's incomplete data, 
Uh, there's inaccurate data, you know, some of the third party data isn't what you thought it was, some of the identity linking doesn't actually link the right identity, so the, the problem is, so you still need panels, so that's why we still have panels, because the panels are helping to calibrate Stitch. and fill in all these holes mm -hmm. along the way, and you know, so it's a hybrid world, and I don't know quite how long that's going to last, but we need to do a lot of work to clean up the data and get, clean up the identity linking. Mm -hmm. But well, one thing I think we got to do, though, as an industry is we've had it lucky in linear TV, and look, that's going to be my basis of comparison just because I've known it for, um, I'm, not a f I'm not under 40. But um, the, <laughs> um, the currency can no longer be the insertion of the spot in the program, right? right? Yeah. The currency I think we got to agree on is, could be the impact of the campaign and the reach and frequency of the campaign. And, the, you know, the thing I wish we had was, from a seller perspective, I mean, think about a brand like CNN. CNN on digital and mobile and TV look dramatically different from each other. Right. And the ability to hear from Lou or Amanda, here's what I'm trying to reach. I want 18 to 49s. I want the CNN brand experience and know how to knit those together. Mm -hmm. I'll stop throwing things at you when that solution is available from us from a from a schedule planning perspective. Mm -hmm. But then we have to agree that it's a schedule that matters, not the individual spot. So you're not saying outcomes. You're not like saying Donna is going to be interested in affiliate deals based on the impact of the totality. You're just saying the cross screen flex is what you're saying. I think eventually we got to get to outcomes. Mm -hmm. But I think first, at least, to know what that schedule accomplishes and understand how we best fight that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think part of Part of what you're saying is in our in this world that we now live in, the idea of a single currency is is much less likely to, to be a reality, right? And I think we would agree completely. We heard earlier today the phrase, you know, bring your own data to the table. Yeah, yeah. I think that is important. I think you're, we're going to have to enable measurement that allows you to bring your own data, define your outcomes, your objectives as as you desire as a buyer and have an alignment between buyer seller and then an independent measurement that tells you whether or not you achieved that and, or at what, you know, at what rate you achieved that, right? So but I you do need a common kind of exposure metric, right. something sure. that we can all yeah. grounded kind of agree in a on that's yeah. grounded that, okay, I know I can divide these people into exposed right. and unexposed you need a and denominator. then you can see what happens and that's kind of, yeah. you know, in an unduplicated way and that's one of, that's the issue that Absolutely. we don't quite have that. But beyond that, it's interesting to see kind of the evolution of everyone working together and having a certain level of data humility that yeah. didn't exist in the last couple of years, yeah. right? There was a, a world a few years ago where everyone was touting they had the best data, the best right. quality right. data, the most you know holistic data views. And now you're seeing this humility say, you know what, we need to actually partner differently, uh -huh. bring your data, have a richer audience understanding using not only the marketer's yeah. data, but maybe from the agency, from three or four partners that maybe used to be competitors that are now sharing. Yeah. yeah. I, do, I did hear a great comment earlier today about, um, I think Peter said it, uh, about the, the middleware, maybe the real value of ad tech middleware is cleaning and standardizing and codifying the data so we can get to the sort of common denominators we need to. So that's great. Uh, pressing on, we're already halfway through our panel and we are a tenth of the way through our questions. Um, Jane, Sim and the 4A's Media Measurement Task Force just completed a white paper on attribution and ROI analysis, um, which I highly recommend if you haven't gotten your hands on it. Um, from your perspective, what are some of the key findings? Um, what do we need to really do to make that happen? And you know, we think we talked about some of those things already. Um, and how far away are we really from that, that sort of cross-channel, cross-platform attribution we've been talking about? Yeah, great. Um, you know, this is a really nice partnership, and we're going to keep working on it with some follow-up, um, you know, other studies. Uh, and, and I highly, you know, the SIM website has lots of free white papers about this attribution white paper. There's one about data enrichment quality. There's one about identity management. Because um, the, you know, the industry has to really be savvy um, users of all of these new data sources. Um, so SIM's all about, you know, education and transparency, and let's all know what we're buying um, here. So. Um, in the white paper, we, uh, it, was, it was really to open up the, and, and kind of make more transparent this whole area of media mix modeling, market mix modeling, which is kind of this top-down approach that we've seen for years that's cross-channel, takes into account all kinds of other external variables. And then we have this uh, bottoms-up digital attribution, which is still only digital. Everybody calls it cross-platform attribution, but it's only happening in digital now. 
But through identity linking and through all of these data matching, these two things are coming together, but they're not kind of quite there yet. And that's really the work that is similar to what we were just talking about. Um, the identity linking needs yeah. to be better. The walled gardens data needs yeah. to uh, be more available. Uh, and just, you know, better data quality, better linking. Okay. So, so we're going to work on some more, um, you know, steps in this area to try to move, move the industry ahead and try to in improve on all this. That's great. We, uh, Mobile Marketing Association, uh, slight, small plug on board, um, we stood up the uh, marketing attribution think tank last year, and it's really a conversational level approach to what are we really trying to do and mm -hmm. how hard do we need to move, and then applying it analytically. And uh, it's really been fascinating because you've got, um, in that organization, you've got marketers, you've got vendors, you've got agency, you've got tech all sitting at the table, and so you can get a perspective. And it's, the more you get into it, the more you gotta get into it. It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating space. So, all right, we started this morning with Mark Pritchard very eloquently renewing his imperative that walled gardens are at odds with marketers' needs from mul multiple perspectives. Um, from the perspectives of measurement and attribution, um, are we now at a point where we need to minimize our reliance on these platforms going forward? Um, can we even buy around them? Is there a way to get the signal that we're not getting at today? I feel like, Amanda, this should start with you, uh, putting you on the spot a little bit. That's okay. We love to say there are no must-buys, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> we can always find the audience across the breadth. Yeah. Um, what's interesting, though, coming out of all of this, I think it is a nice flashpoint for the industry to take a step back from all the speed movement and be pretty united, I'd say, across the holding companies, too, when it comes to a point of view on how to push forward with third-party measurement. How do we move from kind of where we sat in a certain acceptance of walled gardens to truly unearthing the opportunity to not only not just grade your own homework, but actually right. be more transparent in how that's gathered and understanding what the categorizations are around content, and then how do we actually act on that and make sure there's different levels of appetite for risk for clients yeah. and guide them to the right balance of that. Certainly recent press, and even in the last year, um, with the two of the, the two largest walled gardens would suggest that it's time, we, we have to have third party measurement. It's not really an option at this point. Mm -hmm. And I think Linda said it great today, you know, she's like, we have a double standard right now. We're holding the accountable folks to that level of accountability and we're not holding those folks who choose to be less accountable as accountable. And uh, I'm guilty as charged on that and it's caused me a real major rethink. So Aaron? Yeah, I can tell you from sitting inside the third party measurement world, the impact that Mark Keith Weed at Unilever, Verizon, and others, uh, you know, Publicis and, and Group M and others have had over the last, really just the last few months, yeah. is palpable. Um, the converse, not just the conversations, but the actions that are taking place inside the wall gardens are very different than they've been in the past. Um, so there's, there's news coming out literally daily, weekly right now of uh, different openings within those gardens to various forms of measurement. Uh, YouTube has, has started to really respond in a big way as we know here in the past couple weeks. So uh, for us, this is a great thing for the industry. I, I'm, I applaud the, the industry at large for really taking this on in a way that they, I don't think we had done. You're right. I mean, as, as advertisers, we just hadn't put our foots down uh, for a long time. So I, I think it, we're in a good, we're in a better place. We're in a better place now, and uh, we're going to continue to go in the right direction in terms of getting that walled garden access. But you can't stop there. We'll go back to what Jane said. Your question about attribution and about all those kind of things. And the just data getting, for our DMPs. Yeah. Just getting viewability and brand safety you know, enabled at walled gardens doesn't take us to the point where we need to be if we really want to understand marketing impact across every investment that we make as advertisers, right? So yeah. can't stop there. I mean, that might be yeah, the next at, wall garden that we need to address is how do we have um, better cognitivity or trust with clients right. so that their data also becomes part of the right. process in a way that we can better understand versus its own walled garden of how did we drive to sales and the own internal modeling that happens that maybe yeah. gives you the answer, but you really want to understand more of, of what they have and how we can better activate it. And so <laughs> how we have them be part of the active. Absolutely. But one, one other thing just to think about is that each of us play also the role of we're trying to forecast the market, right? And, and if we're trying to count the amount of digital video consumption that's out there in the market, how do you do it without counting right. those guys? Right. 
That's right. Yeah, and you can't dedupe. You can't. You can't figure out uh, unduplicated reach. You can't get all. to this. It's always going to be in, incomplete content ratings or partial content ratings. We joke because if you can't <laughs> add in in an unduplicated way all the no. video that's going out on right. Facebook and Google it now. Yep. No. So I'm going to make a challenge to the room because every one of you here know someone senior at one of the walled gardens. And if you're not sure who the walled gardens are, I'm around later, we can talk about it. <laughs> um, but make a call this week to that person, have the conversation, lean into it. The press is on our side right now. We are, we are at a crossroads in an industry from a relevant standpoint. Make a phone call, have a conversation, make it clear what your expectation is. That's what we as an industry need to do is start advocating for our own future because right now, it's held a little bit hostage. Sorry, that was an agenda. I wasn't supposed to have an agenda as a moderator. <laughs> but and clients too, Lou, because it's, yeah. it's, it, if the advertisers will advocate for what they want and need, it has incredible impact, as I was just saying. Yeah. They, you know, there needs, I mean, ANA is working on this, you know, an Amen. agenda for what they need to advocate for. And now, Bob, if you're still out there, the list. ANA needs to get the clients fired up too. <laughs> I'm gonna come hug you. Like yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna hug He's it out working there. On it. Um, okay, so kind of moving now beyond the sort of plumbing issues that we're talking about here and, and, and attribution, et cetera. You know, we've agreed the world is radically changing, the world that we, we live in. We are able now to curate experiences on a personal level, cross platforms. Uh, we are designing for larger and larger groups of segments and orchestrating sequential messaging um, for individuals within those segments to compete for attention at the exact moment we need to. Peter Naylor said it best this morning, we are moving from one to many to one to one advertising. But what ROI model are we applying to these greatly enhanced and increasingly personalized experiences? Surely we can't just be looking to increase transactional outcomes in the short run. But if that's true, why is there not more buzz around the potential to look at much longer term effects and possibly even, mm. wait for it, customer lifetime value? Is there an ROI on relationships? And if so, can we call that the ROR, the return on relationship? Anyone, <laughs> anyone want to talk about that? Well, well, you know, I actually think that as um, somebody was saying on one of the last panels that um, all of the marketers are finally really understanding the value of their data. I mean, even, and the media companies as well. So everybody is, uh, you know, building out their CRM systems, tr figuring out how they can match it, how they can enhance it. Uh, once you get to that, you know, yeah. then you're kind of like the direct marketers who right. have been doing relationship marketing and lifetime value, you know, metrics for years. Yeah. And so I, th I think that there, it's hard to tell your, you know, your CFO um, <laughs> that you want to well, move from short term to, right. to longer term. But, um, but I think there can be more of a combination. As you know more about your customers, you know more about that, you know, cradle to grave uh, philosophy. Yeah. Well, I'll go back. Lou, I think the key there is something that Mark Pritchard said at the very end of his speech this morning. The key word there is courage because yeah. it's the advertisers who, how many a ABMs sit in their role longer than 18 months, yeah. Yeah. right? And so it, it, it's so difficult to have the incentive on the advertising side to look at the long-term implications right. of this stuff, right? And to understand how to build relationships and what benefit that has in my brand. One thing I do love that PNG did, you look at Mark's title, it's Chief Brand Building Officer. Right. And brand building is different than just advertising or yeah. you know, short-term sales. I, I agree with that. We, we have to connect this to shareholder value. Yeah. That's where the long-term effect comes in, right? So you gotta, you know, everybody's gotta make the number this quarter, right? But at the same time, we also need to be able to contribute to that growth in brand relevancy, brand saliency, and ultimately you know, um, brand uh, equity. And, and I, I just, I don't feel like there's enough of that conversation. I think a lot of that onus is on the client side. I, I'm, I'm here to say that absolutely. Um, I know in my, you know, in my experience, in my career, uh, the number one barrier to innovation is not this quarter, uh, come back and see me in 90 days. And then it's <laughs> not this quarter, come back and see me in 90 days. But I, I think we need to really move the, the ROI conversation um, again, as an industry together, clients, agency partners, media vendors in the tech community and build for a longer term set of effects. For some of us with direct relationships to our customers, that's easier. I get that it's harder for CPG, but we still, I think we have to cross the Rubicon on that one. Howard, you're nodding vigorously. Yeah, so. no, look, I think it's a data, I don't think it's an analytics problem. I think it's more of a data input problem, right? You, you know now when you acquire a new customer, you're able to model whether this is gonna be someone you're gonna have a year relationship with yep. or a 15 year relationship. 
And I think we, sometimes maybe one of the things we're all guilty about, and especially the data geeks on this panel is, you have something like shopper loyalty data and you can measure it and it's sort of like you think that's the end, yeah. Yeah. but it's not, it's just measure, it's uh, only one signal. Yeah. Yep. But I also think it's not just the data and analytics problem, it's the structure and people problem yeah. too. Yeah. I'd argue we're not organized at all yet for the success when it comes to thinking about the creative message. Yeah. We've perfected the media placement through the programmatic, as you've seen with the panel prior. Um, we've got great tools and ability to actually read the story, but we have not really connected what is that holistic experience that we're designing platform-specific creative and understanding the return on that investment as well. Yeah, there, there's a great uh, cartoon strip from like 25 years ago, and in the first one, there's a kid rooting around on the curb uh, under a street light. Second one, cop comes up and says to him, what are you doing down there, son? Kid says, I'm looking for a quarter. You know how old this is, if kid's looking for a quarter. And in the last frame, the cop says, well, are you sure you lost it here? No, I lost it over there somewhere, but the light's better here. And I think that's exactly what's happening <laughs> in the creative issue. Yes. You know, we're, we're, we're getting better. If George Bush 43 were to describe what we're doing, we're getting better and better at measurement, but we still have, you know, relatively limited ability to really tease out the creative effect. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's kind of beyond this, the topic we just talked about. What are the other areas that we all think we need to focus on? Clearly creative orchestration, uh, figuring that out, figuring out the role of content. Anything else that uh, you know, is a burning platform from your perspective um, as we've got the industry leaders out here? Well, I'll mention one thing, um, open standards. You know, Sim's been trying to work on creating um, an open standard uh, audio watermark that embeds ad ID for advertising and IDER entertainment ID registry for content. So standardizing, you know, we could improve the speed and efficiency throughout our entire workflows if we actually all agreed that we would standardize on common identifiers. So I know it's a, it seems like a little, it does, it's a plumbing thing, but, um, it's unbelievable how much a mess it causes. In Taxonomy the, problem. Because yeah. we call everything different names. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, I had a scary thing happen last September during Ad Week, which was the head of product for a major media research company um, stood up on stage and said that age, sex, demographics were going to be a pillar of measurement in the year 2025. <laughs> and I, I thought at that point, it's time to retire. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think the thing we got to do as an industry, and we can now do it for linear TV, is we got to move away from demographics. They've outlived their usefulness. We have to move to audiences. Um, you've hopefully everybody has heard about Open AP, the initiative we. Oh, that's are. my next question. So you want to uh, go there? No, yeah. Oh, no, we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah, go for um, it. <laughs> you know, the whole idea is basically to standardize audience buying and, and execution for linear TV. Joint, it's a cooperative founded by Turner, Viacom, and Fox. The hope is that more people join, more publishers join, and the hope is just to make it easy for Amanda to do this audience deals across all publishers in a big way and make it easy. And forget about women 18 to 49 as, a, as something we Absolutely. care about. That's great, that's great. Anything so that removes complexity, right, from our business? Nice so time. last question goes to Amanda, and uh, you know you have a long history of uh, being able to speak truth to power and making many of us, myself included, listen to things we don't want to hear. And so with that in mind, what are you not getting from clients from the standpoint of a mandate? What would you like it if more clients came to you and said, Amanda, do this for me, or please don't do this for me? I think there's an opportunity that's missed and to use a line that Linda actually threw out, this idea of capacity to iterate. Mm -hmm. We don't give ourselves the freedom to form hypotheses and iteratively test those. We look for the next big thing. Right. Clients want to be where there's you know, the next movement or right. look at it from these quantum leaps instead of making small incremental steps, one hypothesis at a time, one learning at a time, and then learn how to scale that across that organization. And that actually links back a bit to what we heard earlier too, the idea of bravery, yeah. of courage, yeah. mm -hmm. vulnerability, being yeah. willing to put an idea out there, the smallest of scale across your team, learn against that, and then move forward with the next idea, the next idea, with some sense of speed and urgency. 
That's that great. See more of That's great. So clients need to be more patient and disciplined. So we'll work on that for you guys. Well, we'll, we'll get all <laughs> over that. When I was a client of Amanda's, actually at Kellogg's, we we had a, a one of the many statements that we would use all the time is we reserve the right to get smarter. And yeah. I love that because it actually got us off the hook. Anytime we were wrong, we just say, well, we reserve the right to get smarter. But I think the intent was exactly as you're saying, right? We we want to get smarter. We want to do it together, but do it in a do it in a, a test and learn and iterate way. So. Great. Indeed. Howard, Jane, Aaron, Amanda, thank you. I think we're the best panel of the afternoon. <laughs> the only panel of the afternoon. <laughs> and where's Sam Hummus? <laughs> it's measured by who? Yeah. <laughs> Walled garden measurement. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>